Uh, good evening, everyone. We're going to uh, go ahead and get started, so thank you for joining us. Uh, welcome to this edition of the Albers Executive Speaker Series. My name is Joe Phillips. I'm Dean of the Albers School. It's my pleasure to welcome everybody here tonight. Uh, as you know, we're delighted to welcome Kevin McAllister, President and CEO of Boeing Commercial Airplanes. Uh, the title of his presentation is Perspectives on Boeing and Lessons in Leadership. Uh, before we get to our speaker, though, I'd like to invite Father Steve Sundborg, President of Seattle University, to the stage. Father. Uh, thank you very much, Joe, and welcome to this uh, edition of the Albers Executive Speaker Series. It was just a, such a great, great series, and I always want to congratulate the Albers School and Dean Joe Phillips. Uh, we've had such a wonderful relationship at Seattle University with Boeing over 60 or more years that our, re our university would not be what it is without the, the partnership and the connection with uh, the Boeing over all these many years. Um, Boeing is our top corporate recruiter of uh, graduates from Seattle University. We've had over 3,200 employees at Boeing over these years. Uh, they were the co-founders of Seattle University's executive leadership program. We have three endowed chairs that were given to us by Boeing. There's the Frank Wood uh, Chair in Electrical and Computer Engineering, the Frank Schrantz Chair in Professional Ethics, and the William Allen Endowed Chair in the College of Education. We have a Boeing room in the Learning Commons and Library. They've supported uh, hundreds of students with scholarships at Seattle University, and they made a special gift on their 100th anniversary just uh, a little over a year ago. So we're so, so grateful to, to Boeing and to our partnership and how they make us to be a better Seattle University. So it's really our privilege to be able to have their CEO and their President of Boeing Commercial Airplanes with us this evening. Thank you very much. Okay, thank you, Father. Um, before introducing our speaker, uh, let me briefly describe the format. So, Mr. McAllister will make a presentation of about 15 or 20 minutes, then we'll go to questions from our panelists, who I will introduce to you later, and then there'll be time for questions from the audience. As president and CEO of uh, BCA, Kevin McAllister is also an executive vice president of the Boeing Company, a member of the Boeing's executive council, and serves as Boeing's senior executive in the Northwest. He's appointed to his current position in 2016, and thus oversees more than 60% of Boeing's uh, revenues, and um, it is a unit that has produced and services 12,000, over 12,000 commercial jetliners flying around our, our planet. Before joining Boeing, he was president and CEO of GE Aviation Services. And prior to leading that unit at GE, he was vice president and general manager of global sales and marketing. And over a 27-year career at GE Aviation held positions of increasing responsibility. He is a member of the Board of Directors of the Washington Roundtable, which is an organization of business leaders that supports a vibrant Washington state economy. He's also chairman of the Board of Directors of Orbis International, a nonprofit global organization dedicated to supporting affordable, accessible, and sustainable eye care. He is a graduate of the University of Pittsburgh, uh, where he earned his bachelor's degree in materials engineering. Both his parents were math professors, so he knows how to navigate our campus. And he is both a ta Taekwondo and Six Sigma black belt, so watch out. Uh, before we bring him to the stage, though, we want to show a video, so please uh, stay tuned here. The book, I guess that video is uh, being stubborn here. Yeah. Any suggestions in the back? Yeah, I'm too old to run this machine. Is that what you're saying, Father? <laughs> Thank you.
Welcome, Kevin McAllister. Thank you, folks. It's great to be here, and I'll tell you, when you're having a bad day, there's nothing like watching a video of two of our youngest children, the MAX 737 MAX and the 787-10 flying in the sky. It's just uh, makes my heart swell every time, and I confess I've probably watched it now a thousand times. That doesn't mean I've had a thousand bad days. Just I enjoy watching it. Um, I'd like to thank Dean Phillips. Thank you very much. And uh, Father Sundberg, thank you so much for the invite to be here today. Um, the uh, longstanding partnership with Seattle University is very important to Boeing. And um, it's one that when you look at the number of people who have stopped me in the hallways over the last few weeks uh, to say, hey, I hear you're going to speak. Uh, I went there has been rewarding because it just is a pedigree, shows the pedigree of teaching and how important uh, the alumni in Boeing uh, really are. The executive collaboration, executive leader program we've had is another great example. We've been involved since 1998 in order to help drive the development of our young leaders. And I think for me, the hallmark of the engagement goes down to the projects we have, and I think we're at 89 or so driven around year-long projects around interacting between students and members of Boeing as a teaching forum in engineering, but also as a forum that allows you to contribute uh, to our learning. Uh, we've, we've driven $11 million of uh, funding in various facilities and endowments here, and our last in investment was a $200,000 uh, minority outreach and educational um, a donation in 2016. You know, I've been, as you heard, in Boeing for a year and a half, having come from another uh, great company in General Electric. And I gotta tell you, it has been a dream of a lifetime. It is an incredible company with an incredible team. And when I sit back and I was thinking about making the move, it dawned on me the incredible legacy of a company with 100 plus years a hundred plus years right here in Puget Sound. A company that's delivered in excess of 22,000 airplanes out over the years in its history to customers. More than a billion hours of commercial flight. And you think about what that means, it puts in perspective the importance of what Boeing does to connect the world. If you think of the growth of the world in the terms of GDP per capita, the driver of GDP per capita is obviously trade. The driver of trade is people connecting around the world. And one of the greatest statistical correlations you'll see is that trips per capita in the world correlate well to GDP per capita. Um, I'm incredibly impressed with what the team has done in the last year. Record deliveries last year, a strong continued performance. Uh, orders out in the market, uh, very strong in 2017. And uh, some big wins, contributing to a backlog in excess of 5,800 airplanes. So the beauty of that is that's an opportunity, but it is also an obligation. It reminds us every day that we've got to come to work and deliver what we've committed to each of those customers. Just to talk a little bit for the aviation buffs about the industry, uh, the industry song strong. Uh, passenger growth is about 6% year over year. Uh, airplanes are full with load factors around 81% or greater. And IATA predicts a strong year of profitability for our airline customers uh, with around $38 billion uh, predicted globally. In addition to that, the other dynamic that's very important to Boeing is freight. We are the freighter provider for the world. And so whether it's a 6-7 freighter or a 7 freighter, uh, freight is a great in indicator of the global economy. Freight is up over 5% year over year, continues to be strong, and that's been very, uh, very good uh, for the marketplace. 2018's been a pretty exciting year. You know, one of the hallmarks for me was a few weeks ago, uh, we went to the Renton factory to celebrate the 10,000th 737 delivered to customers. You know, it's just an amazing milestone. And um, I want to put in perspective, this airplane went to a great customer of ours, Southwest Airlines. 
And I want to put in perspective what the 737 means to the world. More than 6 million people a day board a 737 somewhere around the world. And when you look at how many people have flown that airplane in its 52-year history, more than 23 billion passengers have boarded a 737 uh, since the beginning, which is roughly three times the world's population. So you think about how important that franchise is, that airplane is, uh, that we make right here, right here in the state of Washington at our Renton factory. The MAX, which is one of the airplanes you saw in the video replacing the 737NG, uh, very strong order backlog for the airplane. It's performing very well in service, very strong reliability, and uh, the family's taking shape. So with our first entry out in service, the MAX 8, the larger variant of this airplane just entered service with Lion Air uh, a few weeks ago. We just flew our first variant of this family, the MAX 7, um, a few weeks ago, and we just froze the design of the largest variant, which we call the MAX 10. That will be the largest of the single aisle airplanes that'll fit up to 230 people. And uh, we launched it last year at Paris Air Show with 361 orders in a few days. That would be one of my happy moments <laughs> in the job. And, uh, you know, the other big transformation, because we have a habit of talking about great airplanes, but I want to talk about great people and great factories. When you look at what Renton does to make 737s right here in Puget Sound, they do in one factory what our competitor does in four. They have been one of the greatest examples of industrial transformation over the years as they've consistently driven capability. In the same building, they've been able to grow the output approaching 52 this year and heading to 57 airplanes a month. Now think about as big of uh, an asset as an airplane is, think about putting 52 airplanes out every month. Um, and that is no small challenge. It's an incredible feat of production system focus and a incredible effort to connect various organizations um, around the business to go do that. 787, our twin aisle, um, has been undisputedly the wide body of choice. Last year was 75% order share amongst the wide bodies. Uh, more than 660 in service. That airplane has carried more than 226 million passengers and um, has opened routes around the world. An airplane that has the range and the economics of a 787 allows customers to fly to city pairs that didn't exist before. So as you put more, uh, as you put more efficient airplanes out in the market with more range and more capability, new destinations emerge connecting passengers and trade around the globe. 777 continues to be a strong uh, franchise and um, the 777X, the latest airplane to come to us, is uh, going to deliver in 2020, and we're starting to put the first airplane together. And for a new person on the block, watching the first airplane start to take shape is an ex tremendously exciting opportunity, and not without its challenges. But the team has done a great job as we continue to work the production system if you look at the factory, you know, we talk a lot about American industrial transformation. I want you to think about the Everett facility. It's the largest building in the world. More than 5 million square feet completely being transformed to make the Boeing company more competitive. By making the Boeing company more competitive, we make, we sell more airplanes, we create more value for customers. And it's been amazing to see how that facility is transformed with robotics, with lean, with new flexible tooling. Incredible opportunity for us to continue uh, to grow in the company. And we're very proud of that airplane. And it's also a great example, along with Renton, of the Boeing investment, the billions of dollars that Boeing has put right here in the Puget Sound to invest 
in, uh, in our competitiveness. Um, you know, one of the things we're looking at, again, you never stop thinking about what's the next opportunity to create value for customers. In this business, you start with what creates value in the marketplace and you work backwards. And we are looking at a new airplane um, that we call middle of the market. It sits between the single aisles and the twin aisles, 210 to 270 passengers, 5,000 nautical miles kind of range. And we think it's an opportunity for us. But, you know, people ask me, well, why is it taking you so long to look at this? And I tell you, when you think about big investments in a market, you want to do them right. Those of you in business school, making sure you understand, is this the right configuration for your customer? Do you understand the global needs today, but also do you understand the emerging market needs of tomorrow? Um, as well as, do you have a business plan that makes sense? So we've made no decision at this point on what we're going to do, but we're working actively to look at, at uh, the airplane, the potential airplane and the business plan. The one thing that I want to press upon everybody is a company can never rest. Leaders can never rest um, on the progress that they've made. The rearview mirror doesn't matter. And so at Boeing, we're very focused on, first, the foundation of credibility, which is deliver on the commitments we make to customers. It is the foundation of credibility we have in the marketplace. But we will always strive to lead in technology, to bring innovative technology that creates value for customers. We focus on sharpening our competitive edge to win in the marketplace. We do that with what we call a champion mindset. It's an ability to look at, in our factories, in everything we do, what's the best we've done over the last weeks and months. And then to understand why it worked and how do we replicate it. And what it does is it drives a focus in the business of learning, replicating good behavior, and driving improvements. Now, when we talk about sharpening our competitive edge and we talk about delivering um, in commitments and meeting technology, nothing, nothing in this industry is more sacred than safety. The number one focus of a company who builds airplanes, supports airplanes, and services them is safety. It's a focus not only in the flying airplane, the flying public, but it's also very much of a focus every day for our employees um, in our factories and across our business. We're consistently focused on investing and developing new capabilities, whether it's robotics, whether it's additive manufacturing, new ways to be disruptive in the supply chain to look for better, faster, more efficient ways to make things. And for those engineers in the room, additive is not only an opportunity for some parts for cost, it's an opportunity to create things that may not be makeable in conventional casting, conventional machining uh, practices today. So it's an exciting opportunity as we look forward. But I want to talk a little bit about digital and analytics. For those of you that heard earlier, I am the son of two PhDs in mathematics, both college professors. Imagine growing up in my house. So I, I love math. I uh, in, enjoy what digital and analytics means. And I want you to think about the ability of moving an airplane through a factory, but having the digital capability to move material and time material availability and information flow with the movement of an airplane. It can be an incredible frontier of productivity improvements, of quality improvements um, in our factories. The thing that I find amazing about analytics is it takes away the rearview mirror. It allows you to look at past performance and understand what you do better, but it also gives you the ability to look predictively ahead. It's a great opportunity for us as we look at the reliability of airplanes to look at the fuel burn economics for our customers around the globe and do more predictive assessments of how will performance change over time and what factors will influence that. But for me, it's also an opportunity to create a better connected, more productive business. It's a single source of truth. 
It replaces these long PowerPoint presentations of, that create work inside a factory with instantaneous learning, instant uh, availability to data, and it creates faster insights in the company. And what I continually hope to do, which is drive more decisions deeper into organizations. An effective company looks to get decisions at the right level of business so that people can make change quicker. We invest in culture. Culture is probably the biggest enabler, in my view, of the success of a business. It's how you simplify. It's how you create simpler organizations, simpler structures, simpler decisions, so that you have as many approvers as you really need and no more. Meetings that are more focused, data that is more available. And so we're very focused on, a, on how we behave with each other, how we collaborate, how we work together, how we make more efficient decisions across the company. And I'll tell you, for me, my best days are when I can get out of the office and do one of two things. What I did today, which was the chance to get out and talk to customers, they're in the tie. Um, or have a chance to walk through the factory. And it never, it never stops to amaze me when you walk to the factory what you learn. Because I see the heart and soul of Boeing. Incredibly hardworking people who find a way to get it done. And so last year we launched, we launched an initiative called Plain and Simple. And it was a way to go listen to the floor, capture the great ideas the mechanics and the people on the floor have, react to them quickly, get them implemented, and get their work in front of all our Boeing employees, in front of our customers, through a website that lifts up the performance of our people, shows how they're changing um, quality, safety, reliability, and value for customers. And for me, it's, uh, it's a great way for me to spend time looking at how incredible the Boeing people really are. You know, as leaders in the room, it isn't all about business. You know, for me, it's a lot about family. It's about business. But it's also understanding that a great company has got to be a good company. Great leaders have to be good leaders. And that means a reinvestment into your local communities. It means a reinvestment into education. It makes it important for us to sit back and say, are we preparing the next generation to lead? But also, are we learning from the next generation? Are we listening to the next generation? And so our focus on education has been incredibly important. 50, 54,000 students engaged with Boeing through various STEM programs. 16,000 books provided to uh, children in need in low-income families. And for me, another great hallmark of the Boeing Company, more than 10,000 veterans, more than 10,000 veterans just here in the state of Washington employed by the Boeing Company. These incredible leaders come in to our company equipped to lead from day one. They understand teamwork, they understand accountability, and I'm very proud to have them as part of our team. So as students, um, I have a couple things. You know, I thought about this as I was coming back from a customer visit today. I thought, what do you tell a room full of students who are far brighter than I am? So I thought, well, I just pass on some hard lessons learned. Number one, covet learning and get ready to be a student for the rest of your life. It doesn't stop here. In fact, the higher you move as a leader in a company, the more of a student you become. Because if you want to be competitive, you have to have peripheral vision. You got to look for your blind spots. You got to be able to see around corners. And the way to do that is very much to continually make what you do every day an exciting learning journey. And let me tell you, when you leave after 27 years in a company uh, 
the GE aviation business that I knew well. I probably knew most of the folks in the, in the business and every site around the globe. When you leave that to come and start anew, you better covet learning. Because let me tell you, in the last 18 months, I've done more learning than uh, I ever thought I'd do. I want you to think about learning also in terms of what are the needs of tomorrow. Too often we think about what is, what is the curriculum that worked for yesterday. You are the generation that will make artificial intelligence what it will be tomorrow in times of how we manage equipment, how we manage factories. You are the generation that's going to make digital analytics a common fiber in, in business. You're the generation that's going to continue to drive robotics. You're the generation that's going to think about great ways to redeploy people, to take people and put them on higher valued work as automation continues to grow. You're going to be the generation who thinks of new commercial strategies, new business strategies, new product offerings, and new markets. The world won't always travel the way it travels today. There'll be new ways, new forms of transportation as we look at the freight world and as we look at the passenger world. Potentially smaller uh, uh, vehicles for cargo, potentially smaller vehicles for passengers. You're the generation that when you covet learning and you focus on the skills of tomorrow, we rely on that for our growth. I tell you to embrace teamwork and diversity. The I generation doesn't exist, not for me. The, the individual who thinks that they got it all, they know all the answers, it's about them. You know, they don't last long because in a business, you've got to lean into people. You've got to rely on others. And diversity, I think, is the greatest strength of any company. It's the ability to take people who have very different life experiences, who have different capabilities, who are different people, different beliefs, different genders, diff different ethnic backgrounds, and put them all together in a business where you can harvest on that strength of what we do. Strong leaders are great connectors. Practice it. Practice it on the teams you're with. You know, to me, when you build people and connect them, you create loyalty in a business, you create value in your, your teammates, and people respect that. I'd say three, do what you commit to do. You know, I call it the say-do ratio of one. And so you might meet people that say they're going to do a lot, then don't follow up. And you meet people that do a lot, but, but they're not out thinking about what they might change. Make sure that as you think about who you are and what you do, your credibility with others is about a say-do ratio of one. Follow up, execute on what you said you were going to get done. And last, I think, challenge paradigms. I, you know, I had an opportunity to uh, meet a, a young engineer in our business who really, in a meeting, questioned um, in a very, maybe an emotional way, but in a very passionate way, a decision that we'd made. And I had a chance to meet the, the employee later on. An employee was very, very concerned. He said, you know, I, I'm, I'm sorry, I, 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 I pushed him pushed really hard. I believe in this and I, I'm worried that maybe I did something wrong. Maybe it'll impact my career. I said, you know, you're walking around worried about whether challenging my view um, will impact your career. And I'm walking around going, I want 20,000 more of you. And so people that can come in and challenge the paradigms of how we do things, but do it in a way that balances IQ and EQ. It balances your emotional passion with a well-thought-out plan or a well-thought-out strategy. Don't worry about being right. You know, I'm, I guarantee you there are, there are very few days where I'm more right than wrong because I don't have to. 
because I think about just tapping the very best idea I can find across the company. Now with that, I'll uh, stop right here and let the panel have uh, a couple of questions, or, and then I guess we'll take questions from the audience. All right, thank you. I want you to know I brought a couple experts with me just in case the questions get too tough. <laughs> okay, so you can see our format here as we have our three panelists. I'll very briefly introduce you to them and then we'll get started here. So uh, let's see, in the middle is Braden Wild. Braden is a senior from Erie, Colorado, and he's a international business and economic development major, and he's had two internships at uh, Boeing while he's been here, and he has founded a student-run business called Mott Mott Coffee, and he will, after graduation, take a job with Starbucks in their finance rotation development program. So Braden's there in the middle. Then uh, the closest to me is Lindsay Davis. Uh, Lindsay is a senior manager at Boeing uh, in their HR uh, function, and she is uh, currently a student in our EMBA program, and she will graduate in June. And then uh, furthest from me is Joe Lopez. Joseph is got his undergraduate degree at Seattle U a few years ago. He's currently working with Boeing as a property management specialist, and he also had an internship while he was here at Seattle U with Boeing. And I'm glad to know that he's going to be joining our MBA program in the fall, right? So those are our three panelists. Lindsay, you're closest. You get to go first. Oh, man. OK. So I debated a little bit about what to open with, but I think uh, the most interesting as it relates to leadership is the cultural differences coming from GE to Boeing and how that has impacted your leadership style or your ability to lead or what kind of changes you've had to make uh, to work within the new environment. Well, you know, Boeing was not entirely new to me because I'd spent the greater part of the last uh, really tw 20 years working very closely with the folks like Ray Connor, who, who um, uh, preceded me. And uh, for example, in the product support side, we worked very closely between Boeing and GE on, on how the fleet was performing in sales. Uh, Ray Connor and I used to go out all over the world and work to win on campaigns. But so when I came in, you know, very, very candidly, I thought I had a much better feel for the culture than I did. You know, it's one of the revelations to me is business cultures are different. You know, how I grew up in GE Aviation, I had spent 27 years in one business. Now, I'd worked in every single pocket of the company, but I spent 27 years in one business. There was very little about what we did, about how decisions were made, that I didn't either know or know who to call. So coming into Boeing, culturally, um, you have to do a ton more listening. I've had to uh, put aside how I believe a company should work, how I believe we should message, and spend a lot more time listening to the leadership and listening to the employees as to what matters. The thing that was easiest for me was listening to customers because I'd been out in customers, we'd been talking about airplanes together with Boeing for a lot of years. But for me, coming in the culture is, is with people who love making the best airplanes in the world. They, no matter where you go in the company, the love for American airplanes, um, you just can feel it. Now, how decisions get made, how the business is structured, how we focus on the agenda that I wanna drive, which is how do we become more, continue to be competitive on our airplane products, lead with the best airplanes in the world, but also uh, continue to fund our future. You know, I think the big focus is cost competitiveness is very important because if you're more cost competitive, if you can create more speed, you create capacity. You create capacity, you can bring in more jets. You can bring in more jets, you can help employment. And, and when you get more cost competitive, you can reinvest that in the future of the business. And I think that's been a big push for me to drive in the company and also 
to really bring a big focus on connecting the digital world with the industrial uh, world when we go. So it's been an exciting journey. Um, I, not everything I've done uh, I, I'm, I, has, gone, has gone well. I've had some tough lessons learned. But the great thing about a great company is when you, there's a lot of people around to help point you in the right direction. Um, I, I've heard a lot about your, your sense of humor, how you're willing to you know, accept other viewpoints. You, know, you want to be challenged. You want to bring in all voices. Um, and for me, as a current student here aspiring you know, to be a young a business leader, as many people in this room today, um, I always bring it back to, to ethics and what is your inner drive. Um, and we're here on a Jesuit campus, right, that values social justice, that values discernment. Um, and I'm curious how you in your personal life and managing your team, what kind of management style and ethics do you bring to your team? What do you hope to drive in, in the company? And how do you, you know, use that to drive a good business, a great business? You know, I think um, the foundation of any company has to be built on on a on great on great ethical grounds and so my view is I have to hold myself to the same standard that I hold anybody in the company we as leaders have to hold ourselves to a higher standard and I think the um, how we conduct ourselves is really important you know we've got to be approachable I think leaders have to be able to be approachable so that people feel comfortable talking to you. I think we have to have a sense of humor. Some days it's the only way to get through the day. Um, I think we've got to be humble. You know, I will tell you that arrogance is the worst trait I see. I have very little tolerance for it. Inquisitiveness is something I cherish. You know, people that want to look at a problem around all grounds. You know, on a personal note, um, my faith is very strong. It, it affects me as an individual. It affects how I think about what I do. Um, it's very important to my wife, wife and I. And um, I don't think anybody should feel like, you know, we are people first. You know, we, how we interact in the community, how we interact with people. I think the more honest, the more true you are, the uh, more people want to be around you, the more people want to want to want to follow. So, uh, like many of the panel uh, or speakers up here, I had a hard time kind of deciding what to ask. But uh, so I'll start with this. In 2017, you had 600 and, or 763 deliveries, maintained a backlog of 912 orders. Uh, you had a great inaugural year as CEO of Commercial Airlines. But I'm curious to know: uh, was there a failure or a challenge that you experienced in this first year that you didn't expect? Uh, what did you learn from it, and how did you uh, handle it? You know, um, I think we had a great year. <laughs> you know, I, I think the company did in 2017. Uh, I'm talking about 2017 performance because we're obviously in quiet period with earnings coming out. So the, the, uh, the, I think the team did very well and I'm very, very proud of them. Um, I think the, are, are there issues? Tough lessons learned every single day. Uh, we've had uh, campaigns where uh, I wish we would have won we have uh, issues that we manage in, in the field that I wish we were more responsive to. We have decisions that, that I made that, that um, maybe I would have been better off uh, empowering somebody deeper in the organization to make. Um, calendar management is really important to me. I, I try not to spend time on things that don't create value. I try to make sure I push decisions deeper in the organization. I'm um, also because they're the people who know what to do. Um, I try to cultivate an organization that collaborates so that we don't get single point decisions. But, you know, there are, there are tough challenges each and every day. Some of them have applied, uh, for me, have been things I, in the factory that, that if I would have spent a little bit longer focusing on, maybe we would have made a different call with customers. There are, there are, there are points where we, we, uh, we could have done something better to attack a problem faster. I think, you know, when you pick up the newspaper, you, 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 people ask, they say, hey, I hear something's that you have an issue. And I go, boy, I wish I had one. You know, <laughs> <laughs> we got issues every day. And I think the, the ability to allocate the right people around the right problems to make the right decision, that's what leadership, at least for me, is all about. 
Okay, talking about issues. Yeah. So there's been some discussion in the news about a pending trade war. How do you think that activity in particular with one of our largest regions that purchases our aircraft, how do you think that's going to impact BCA? Okay, now the questions are heating up. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, no, look, I, I uh, you know, I've had, obviously, we're, I want you to put this in perspective. 90% of our employee base is in the United States. 80% of what we build and deliver is outside the United States. So put that in perspective. We're the largest exporter in the U.S. 90% of our employment here, 80% of what we build goes somewhere else in the world. So um, you've got to be global in a business like this. You have got to be incredibly, we have to be incredibly engaged with customers all over the world. Um, I think that rational heads prevail. My focus, um, and you mentioned the large market, China. China is obviously a very large and very important market. It's the fastest growing economy in the world. It has got a very strong, fast growing aviation community. And uh, Boeing airplanes have helped connect China with the rest of the world and have connected China. Um, I'll be there in uh, very short order. I spend, uh, I get to China on, on a number of times per year. I'm proud of the relationships we have with airlines. And I think our role is to continue to encourage dialogue and continue to create great value around the world for customers. And I, you know, I, I, I think that's all you can do in a, in a time like that. Um, I, I wanted to ask you, uh, as you look forward into the next couple of years where you're really getting to shape and mold a little bit more what Boeing Commercial looks like as they move forward, where do you see the next big threat or challenge coming to Boeing? Um, and and do, how do you feel like the organization has to change in order to, to meet or match that threat? I think we've got to have a good long cycle view of how travel will change. Um, you know, what, what, how people will move around the world. And I think that's something Boeing does extremely well. I think um, we have to be very engaged in markets outside of the U.S., very engaged with customers, understand what they're looking at. But I think we've got to also invest in, in new capabilities. I, you know, we have been very focused in doing partnerships, doing J, JVs, doing investments to look at what the future of travel may be. Are there opportunities for very small freighters, for example, that travel very short distances with small uh, cargo loads? We have to be thinking about what are the great ideas of tomorrow, and we've got to be able to move like a small business very quickly in getting the right people around them and. Uh, and, and making those, those products happen with Boeing. I mean, we have enormous. The other thing is, I think, learning from around the company. It is amazing for me that this is, Boeing is a business that makes commercial airplanes, makes satellites, you know, has a defense business, has got capability, functional capability around the company. And I, it's amazing to me, I just spent some time with some folks uh, this week from the space business doing something that is immediately of value to how we think about tackling some, um, some issues we're working on inside commercial aviation. And so I think I worry about a company that always continues to learn from each other, that accelerates that learning, that keeps it simple, and that really has a good outside-in view of the world. You know, very often you meet people and you see companies that have a very inside-out view. They believe everything that they see within the walls of what they do. And I think one of the hallmarks of Boeing is it is very focused on an outside-in view, a market view of how do we look in the eyes of our customers, how do we look in the eyes of the market, and um, you know, how, do we, how do we be really inquisitive on how we want to drive change? Uh, my last question is uh, something of kind of this challenge uh, kind of topic that we've, uh, Bryn kind of had hinted at. Um, you know, Boeing thrives on that single aisle, twin aisle kind of plane that allows us to connect more cities and that hub kind of spoke model on it. And I'm curious, you know, with the volatility of the market right now and with the increasing prices of you know, jet fuel or even just the environmental awareness that you know, we're seeing because of travel, uh, you know, what do you kind of see and vision for Boeing going forward in that? And also, you know, is Boeing gonna be the first that company that makes the first, you know, non-fossil fuel 
powered plane? Is that you know, ultimately what you see is the goal of what aviation and travel should be? I, I think the, um, in terms of the, the, the question, I think there obviously for us, we've got to continue to evolve technology. We've got to, but you've got to evolve technology in a way that creates value for customers. Um, how that will change, uh, obviously, you know, the interesting thing is you look at a 777 today and you look at a 777 or even a 737 of NG of today versus 737 um, of a few years ago. You know, we've driven 5% improvements since the airplane first in fuel burn since it first developed. Every generation of airplanes is 20% improvement in fuel economics. It's reductions in noise. It's reduction in carbon emissions. And so I think as we think of tackling the environmental responsibilities around the globe, I think the aviation business does that very well by creating much more fuel efficient uh, uh, airplanes, by, by reducing emissions in, in CO2 and NOx, and by continuing to create advantages in noise. It's one of the industries that does that uh, very, very well. Um, I think will we be the, fir we'd like to be the first in the things that create value for the emerging needs of our customers today and our customers of tomorrow. And we spend a lot of time, uh, we're not gonna publicly disclose all the ideas we have today, but we're spending a lot of time looking at what those might be. Okay, so now we're gonna switch to some questions in the audience. There'll be a mic in each aisle. And uh, you, if you have a question, raise your hand and we'll try to get the mic to you. First question over here. So despite um, increased demand in uh, airplanes, commercial airplanes across the world, um, there's been supply chain issues that have kind of plagued both you and your competition. Um, as demand increases in the next five or 10 years, how does Boeing plan on working with suppliers to ensure that not only the quantity, but the quality of those parts um, is up to your standards? You know, it is a, it's an excellent question because you think of rating up on a 737 or uh, rating up, you know, doing more airplanes per month on, on uh, 787. You know, you've got to have a supply chain ready because you, an airplane's not much good if it's missing a part. And so it's, you know, to, to have people say, well, I'm 99% on time, uh, it doesn't really help if the 1% doesn't allow you to deliver the product you commit to customers. And so the thing I, you know, as we, uh, the Boeing uh, team has done very well, and I think the supply chain has done well, is to practice in the preseason and to make sure that as you're in the supply chain, you have a seamless focus on what needs to be delivered over the years, that the readiness of raw material is there, that the producibility is there. You know, a big focus of bringing a new product to the market and that impacts supply chain readiness is do you have the simplicity, the producibility, the manufacturability of the design? And we spend a lot of time focusing on that. Now, when you have issues, and you know, you, we've had issues on the, on the 737 MAX at the beginning relative to um, a leap engine, um, the, the issue, you know, we were able to get through that and not miss our delivery commitments to our customers. And in that case, when you have problems, the supply chain has to work very quickly. And so it's something of constant vigilance. It's a, it's a big focus of our organization um, as we run into the issues to be able to management. And uh, we have a number we're working through right now. Um, we do it with our suppliers. I think the ability to go really think through what do you want to make versus what you want to buy. You know, what do you want to have internal to the company that you manage versus what do you want somebody else to produce for you in the supply chain is an, even, is an increasingly more important decision to make. I think the decision of where do you want to have one supplier versus where do you want to have multiple suppliers, diversification of risk is really important consideration in how we manage our business. And then last, to stress test, you know, in the preseason, before you're going to hit a rate, to go stress test the ability of the supply chain to deliver is something that uh, we spend a lot, of, a lot of time doing. I think seeing an issue, reacting very quickly to it, but getting more predictive on forward risks, I think is an area where analytics and digital will really help us, not just within the company, but within the supply chain. I mean, imagine, think about the linearity of a digital thread that says you can connect your supplier's uh, throughput with your airplane throughput in one visible thread 
all the way across uh, the business. I think that's an opportunity for productivity. It's a win-win play for Supply Base, and it's a win-win play for us. So Marjorie Polanco, I'm a graduate student here studying business analytics. So you have been credited as a creative deal maker, and just recently you were credited for breaking um, a deal uh, between Boeing and Spirit Aerospace. And I wanted to kind of get your um, mindset. Um, what methods, what techniques did you use, or any leadership tips that you might have for us? Well, I, I wouldn't claim responsibility for Spirit. I, it's nice that the newspaper said that, but I, I would tell you it's, it's not true. Um, you know, I was, I, 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 I prefer not true good things versus not true bad things. But uh, it was a team that, a team that got that done. But I will tell you, for anybody who has a commercial headset, you know, I've been involved with deals all around the world. Multi-billion dollar deals, um, previously for engines, for tens of billions of dollars of deals, hundreds of billions of dollars of deals in the, in the engines and services world, and now at Boeing with customers. And I think a couple things I'd, I'd tell you. One, you win in the off season. When you're negotiating a deal, and it's getting down to decision time, and you haven't established the value of your product, you're gonna lose. And so winning in the off season is an incredibly important part of what I call the stages of selling. The stages of selling or commercial deals is in off season, which is how are you doing on today's airplanes? How are you fulfilling on the customer? How are you engaging today? The preseason, which is establishing the value of the product you're out in the market selling. Game time, which is waking up every day with an absolute thirst to win and hunting in packs. You know, at game time, we don't, the days of a single seller are gone. When you wanna go win, you hunt in a pack. You bring every capability that you need. You engage like tentacles into your customers so you understand their articulated and unarticulated needs. You understand who are the decision makers, who are the influencers. A lot of times I watch people who are you know, who, who, want the, who love the art of the deal, they focus on the top, the decision maker. But they don't focus on the influencers. So who do they listen to? Who do leaders listen to? When we go approach winning in the marketplace, we focus on both. Who, what messages do you want to place in what area? And I think it's one of the great lessons for me is enterprise to enterprise engagement really matters. You want to win a deal in supply chain or you want to win a deal with customers, leverage the key people who speak the language of the fleet chief, of the pilots, of the, of the procurement office, of the CFO, so that you've got that tentacle of capability into one listening team. The other part of the stages of, of competing is the game films. You know, after you win or you lose, you learn. And it's always, for me, you learn in losing. You know, it, it uh, you know, there are days when losing is tremendous. When you lose in a deal, it's 20 years. You know, you lost. And, um, you know, after I cry a little bit, you know, I try to focus on what could we have done better. But I think leaders also have to learn when they win. And it may be more important to learn when you're winning than it is to learn when you're losing. What did your competitor do? What stuck with the customer? And so I always focus on build models on how your customers make decisions. Understand how they valued your product. Understand how they monetize the value that you create. And I think that outside in piece of commercial deal making is really important. You know, I, 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 for me, it is, it's a real high to win. Um, you know, we just had a great opportunity to win at American Airlines and at Hawaiian Airlines over the last couple of weeks. Those, those aren't done at dinners. You know, those aren't done over the phone. You know, those are things that months and months and months of listening, learning, and, and uh, creating a value offering, a multiple set of currencies that create value for, for, for that customer. It's, uh, you know, that's, if there's one thing I think that I've really enjoyed over the last two decades, it's understanding how to get a better external outside in view of uh, competing in the market.
One last question. Hello. Uh, can you comment something on the Embraer deal? <laughs> no. <laughs> Only to say, look, it's a, it is, a, it is a, obviously an opportunity we're taking. We're taking, we're working today, and I can't make any more comment beyond that. <laughs> I'll take another. There's one more. You're, okay, one more question. Yeah. Just can't be a yes or no question. Yeah. <laughs> Hi, I, uh, I'm an incoming MBA student. Uh, I have a quick question for you about the Washington Roundtable. Can you talk a little bit about the importance of networking with other business leaders and yeah. individuals and what you've learned from the likes of Blake Nordstrom and Dan Fulton's of the world and yeah. what you get out of that? You know, for me, uh, being brand new to the state of Washington um, and uh, it's been a unique opportunity, first of all, to understand what's here, but also to tap into leaders who've done a great job in their own business that might have a view of how we make um, a very competitive workforce here in Washington. What is it that we want our messaging to uh, state and local governments to be? Um, what are learnings that we can leverage? And I think you know one of the big focuses for us is the workforce of tomorrow. Um, it is really important to those of us that have large bases here. You know, how do we how do we create a very competitive educational system? How do we tap into talent? And I, for me, it's been a really great learning vehicle. I think it's uh, a very uniquely talented team. Uh, Seattle Roundtable is also um, the, the uh, an incredible opportunity uh, for me. The, the chance to meet leaders right here in Seattle. I mean, I get to talk to people day in and day out, like like. Uh, you know, at least once a month, I'm sorry, like Brad Smith at Microsoft, who I wouldn't otherwise spend time with, but, you know, they tackle some of the same issues that we do. And to get a chance to learn from each other, see how they're thinking about local issues and more global issues has been very effective uh, uh, for me. It's a, great, it's a great welcome to the state of Washington. Well, let's give Kevin a round of applause and thank you for being here. Again, thank you very much, Kevin, for being with us tonight. And we'll see you May 22nd. That's our next speaker series event.